All right, let's uh, keep going with our potential energy. So we were talking about potential energy being stored in energy. And what happens when you have to, when you do work against gravity? When you do work against gravity, then the force you're applying is equal to the weight, or Fg, and the height you're raising it, the delta D, is really a height. And so it becomes Mg Hf minus Hi. When you multiply by the Mg, it's Mg Hf minus Mg Hi. Okay? This MGH is actually called the gravitational potential energy. So it's EG and it's equal to MGH. Gravitational potential energy. Okay? And so this then is the change in gravitational potential energy because it's the final minus the initial. Okay? So you'll sometimes see it written as delta EG is equal to MG delta H. <clears throat> and this stuff up here, just like the stuff back here, was me just showing you where it's coming from. I would never ask you to derive it. So back here we found the work done was equal to the change in kinetic energy. So if the object you do work on an object and it changes its speed, then you would use this. If you do work on an object and it changes it, its height, then you would use the gravitational potential energy. Now in real life, gravitational potential energy, usually the initial is zero, right? If I ask you what's the change in gravitational potential energy when I lift this calculator from the desk up to my shoulder, well, we would call the height of the desk where it's sitting to start with zero. And we would use the distance up to my shoulder. We would measure it from the desk. So like gravitational potential energy doesn't really have a lot of meaning unless you do it with reference to something, right? I could hold my pen and say, what's the gravitational potential energy of it? Well, do I mean to the desk, to the floor, to the surface of the earth? You need whatever the HI is, we usually call that zero. Okay, and so lots of time you will see the delta EG just written as G M G H because the I will assume is zero. Okay, so let's do an example. Let's say you lift a textbook, a three kilogram textbook, and you're going to lift it off the desk 1.2 meters. Okay, so its final height would be 1.2 meters. And its initial height, we would be is taking the desk as the origin, and so it would be zero. And so then the, the question would be, how much work um, has, the, has, the, has been done on the book, or what is its change in gravitational potential energy? So if you want it, you could write MGHF minus MGHI, but knowing that the HI is zero, we will often just write the change in gravitational potential energy is equal to mg, and really it's a delta h, so you could write it as delta h, and so then you would do 3 kilograms times 9.81 meters per second squared times the 1.2 meters. Okay, delta eg will be equal to, I think you get 35.316, it's still energy, Kilogram meters per second squared, that's a joule, times a meter, or excuse me, that's a newton, times a meter, it's still joules. Okay, so the gravitational potential energy of this book, once I've lifted it 1.2 meters, will be 35.316 joules. Okay, and so you will have some homework questions with these tonight. All right, there is another type of potential energy, and I'm just going to mention it, and then we'll come back to it the next day. And the second type of potential energy, our third type of energy in total, is elastic potential energy. If you've ever stretched a spring and then let it go, what you've done is created elastic potential energy. So elastic potential energy is energy in things that will stretch or compress. Its symbol is capital E with an E for elastic. Okay, 
So mm -hmm. when you stretch or compress something, you're giving it elastic potential energy. Remember we said potential energy, was a uh, test for it was if you released it and it moved. So stretch a spring out really long and let it go. What's it going to do? It's going to zing back together. Or compress it a whole bunch down into a tiny little spot and let it go. It's going to bounce out. So in both cases, it has elastic potential energy. Now when you stretch or compress a spring, you have to do work on it to do that. Okay, and um, the spring is also going to try to prevent itself from being stretched. So to do work, you have to apply a force, F, over a distance. But this time, the force that you're applying is going to change, right? Imagine stretching a spring. When you first start to stretch it, you don't need a very big force because it's easy to stretch. But the more you stretch it, the bigger and bigger the force gets, is, is needed to stretch it, okay? So this force is um, known, the force we apply has a counterpart, and the counterpart is called the restoring force. And what I mean by that is if you stretch a spring and you were to listen to the molecules in the spring, they would be like, man, I really don't like being stretched this way. And they would be putting a force in the opposite direction, trying to restore the spring back to its regular shape. So when we stretch the spring, the force we put on is dependent on two things. It's dependent on how much we stretch it, which is X, or compress it. And it's dependent on the properties of the spring. If you imagine if I took the spring out of this click pin, it wouldn't take a lot of force to stretch it. But if I took the spring out of the shocks in my car, it would take a lot more force to stretch it the same distance as the spring in this pen. So the other factor is called a K. And K is known as the spring constant. And the thicker, the heavier, more heavy duty the spring, the more force we're going to need, so the bigger the K. X is the distance stretched or compressed. Distance stretched or compressed. It doesn't matter which one it is because it's only a distance. It's not, um, it's not a displacement, right? Because we're dealing with um, scalars now, okay? So F equals K, when well, I'm thinking about energy when I say scalars. So F equals KX, so if I want to stretch a spring two meters, I multiply it by the spring constant and I figure out how much force do I need to apply. If I want to stretch, compress it three meters, I do the same thing. So the spring constant, its units are going to be newtons per meter, so that then when I multiply it by meters, I get back newtons. Okay, so again, the spring constant tells us how big, um, how heavy duty the spring is, how hard it is to stretch it. You will see this is the force that I need to stretch the spring. Sometimes you will see the equation written as F equals negative Kx, and when you see this, it's the force that the string, spring needs to put on itself to bring itself back to its original shape. These equations are known as Hooke's Law. And for those of you in bio, this is the same hook that you've seen in bio. Okay, Hooke's Law. And we're going to use the, this equation to come up with the elastic potential energy. So right now, this is just force. And next day when we get together, we'll come up, we'll figure out an equation to find the elastic potential energy based on the work done by this force, okay? And so that's enough, and now you have, you'll have some questions to do with these new equations.